In the dark shadows, in the white cold, fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read the ancient tomes. The order of the Abracast. We are the brave and the bold. An old English newspaper, the London Chronicle, for June 1760, contains the following antidote. With regards to music, he not only played, but composed in both high taste. Nay, his very ideas were accommodated to the art. And in those occurrences which had no relation to music, he found means to express himself in figurative terms deduced from this science. There could be not a more artful way of showing his attention to the subject. I remember an incident which impressed it strongly upon my memory. I had the honor to be at an assembly of lady who, to many other good and great accomplishments, added a taste for music so delicate that she made a judge in the dispute of masters. This uh, stranger... Uh, was to be of the party and towards evening he came in his usual free and polite manner but with more hurry than was customary and with his fingers stopped in his ears I can conceive easily that in most men this would have been a very ungraceful attitude and I am afraid it would have been construed into an ungenitive <laughs> genteel entrance Whew, dodged a bullet but he had a manner that made everything agreeable they had been emptying a cartload of stones just at the door to mend the pavements he threw himself into a chair and when the lady asked what was the matter he pointed to the uh, the place and said I am stunned with the whole cartload of discords. In his memoirs, the Italian adventurer Jacques de Casanova de Saint-Gault makes numerous references to his acquaintance with St. Germain. Casanova grudgingly admits that the Count was an adept at magical arts, a skilled linguist, musician and chemist who won the favor of the ladies of the French court, not only by his general air of mystery surrounding him, but by surpassing skills in preparing pigments and cosmetics by which he preserved for them at least a shadow of swift departing youth. Your body is your temple. So let's make sure you got a badass t-shirt on it. Variety of cool occult themed t-shirts. And other merch like stickers, wall art, mugs, and more. Visit the storefront on abracast.com. The Abracast. Occult, history, conspiracy, and violence. Hey everybody, welcome to the Fellow Craft episode of the Abracast for September 2020. I am your host, John Towers. I'm up to my ears in pickles and pasta sauce trying to process this garden. And this is the Abracast. Um, tonight we're going to be continuing on our... Um, talk about the Count de Saint Germain. The book that we're going to be mostly in this evening is the Most Holy Trinisophia. 
But we are going to uh, begin here properly in the uh, trusty old Encyclopedia of Occultism by Lewis Spence. Before we get into before we get into anything, I just want to uh, stop and collaborate and listen. And just say that uh, I hope everybody is being safe and sound. I hope everyone's doing some proper, I don't know what they call it nowadays, self-care. I hope everyone's doing some self-care, checking in on the the mental health and the mental health of your loved ones while um, a lot of our country is still in some form of lockdown um, or another. Those of you that I've been speaking to seem to be doing well, and I truly appreciate that. I'm doing okay. My wife is doing good. So, um, yeah. So there you go. Um, all right. So, yeah, let's get into it. Here's to you guys, though. Thank you so much for your support on all the levels. I really do appreciate it. Here's to you. Thank you very much. How about all that John Galt business last week? Whoa, brother. I guess two weeks ago for you guys. All right, so uh, Encyclopedia of Occultism, the Compendium of Information on the Occult Sciences, Occult Personalities, Psychic Science, Magic, Demonology, Spiritism, Mysticism, and the Metaphysics by Lewis Spence. He's got a nice chunk here about uh, the account... And um, I just thought that it would be kind of fun before we get back into the Trinisophia. Born probably about 17, oh, hold on, 1710, one of the most celebrated mystic adventurers of modern times. Like Cagliostro and the others of his kind, almost nothing is known concerning his origin, but there is a reason to believe that he was a Portuguese Jew. There are, however, hints that he was of royal birth, and these have never been substantiated. One thing is fairly certain, and uh, that it uh, he was an accomplished spy. That's interesting, for he resided at many European courts, spoke several languages fluently, and was even sent upon diplomatic missions by Louis the Fifteenth. He had always an abundance of funds at his command, and uh, and is alluded to by Grimm as the most capable and able man he had ever known. He pretended to have lived for centuries, to have known Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, and many other persons of antiquity. But although obviously a charlatan, the accomplishments upon which he based his reputation were in many ways real and considerable. Especially was this the case with regards to chemistry, a science in which he was certainly an adept. He pretended to have secrets for removing the flaws from diamonds uh, and to be able to transmute metals. And of course, he possessed the secret elixir of life. He is mentioned by Horace Walpole as being in London... I'm sorry, hold on, I got some microphone issues here. This book is big. Um, Walpole being in London about 1743 and as being arrested as a Jacobite spy who was later released, Walpole, we mentioned that he was arrested. Did we? No, that might be in something I have coming up. Scratch that. But here, would that add some context to it, right? He is called an Italian, a Spaniard, a Pole, uh, somebody who married a great fortune in Me- Mexico and ran away with her jewels to Constantinople. A priest, a fiddler, a vast nobleman, five years after his London experience, he attached himself to the court of Louis the Fifteenth, where he exercised considerable influence over the monarch and was employed by him upon several secret missions to Alderan. He was distinctly the fashion about this time, for Europe was greatly inclined to the pursuit of the occult at this epoch. And he, 
as he combined mystical conversation with a pleasing character and not a little flippancy. He was the rage, but he ruined his chances at the French court by interfering in a dispute between Austria and France. And he was forced to remove himself to England. He resided in London for one or two years, but we trace him to St. Petersburg in 1762, where he is said to um, have assisted in a conspiracy which placed Catherine II on the throne of Russia. After this, he traveled to, Ger to Germany, where he is said uh, in the memoirs of Cagliostro to have become the founder of Freemasonry and to have initiated Cagliostro into that rite. If Cagliostro's account can be credited, he sees it about the business with remarkable splendor and not a little bombast posing as a deity and behaving in a manner calculated to gladden pseudo mystics of the ages. He was nothing if not theatrical. And it is probably for this reason that he attracted the land grave Charles of Hesse who set aside the residence for the study of the occult sciences. He died at Schwelswig, somewhere between the years of 1780 and 1785. The exact date of his death and the circumstances are quite unknown. It would be a matter of real difficulty to say whether he possessed any genuine occult power whatsoever. And in all likelihood, he was merely one of these charlatans in whom his age abounded. Against this view might be set in the circumstance that a great many really clever and able people of his own time thoroughly believed in him. But he must remember the credulous nature of the age in which he flourished. It has been said that 18th century Europe was skeptical regarding everything save occultism and its professors. And it would appear to unbiased minds that this circumstance could have been no better uh, illustration than the career of Count St. Germain. A notable circumstance regarding him was that he possessed a magnificent collection of precious stones. Yes, I seem to remember reading something about these stones, which some consider to be artificial, but which others, better able to judge, believe to have been genuine. Thus he presented Louis XV uh, with a diamond worth 10,000 liver livers of all sorts of stories were in circulation concerning him. One old lady professed to have encountered him at Venice 50 years before where he posed as a man of 60 and even his valet was supposed to have discovered this secret of immortality. On one occasion, a visitor rallied this uh, man upon his master being present at the marriage of Ca Cana and Galilee, asking him if it were the case. You forget, sir, was the reply. I've only been in the Count's service for a century. So, <laughs> clever. Very funny. Okay, back to the Trinisophia uh, from the cold open. We were talking about the memoirs of the Italian adventurer Jacques de Casanova de Sengolt. Casanova describes a meeting with St. Germain, which occurred in Belgium under the most unusual circumstances. Having arrived in Tournay, Casanova was surprised to see some grooms walking spirited horses up and down. And he asked to whom these fine animals belonged to, and was told to the Count de Saint Germain, the adept who had been here a month but never goes out. Everybody who passes through uh, the place wants to see him. And he makes himself visible to no one. This was sufficient to excite the curiosity of Casanova, who wrote, requesting an appointment. He received the following answer, quote, the gravity of my occupation compels me to exclude everyone. But in your case, I will make an exception. Come whenever you like. 
and you will be shown in. You need not mention my name, nor your own, but I do not ask you to share my re- my repast, for my food is not suitable for others. Do you least of all? If you your appetite is what it used to be, end quote. At nine o'clock, Casanova called and found that the Count had grown a beard two inches long. In discussion with Casanova, the Count explained his presence in Belgium by stating that Count Cobenzel, Cobenzel, the Australian ambassador at Brussels, desired to establish a hat factory a hat factory and then he was taking care of the details upon his telling St. Germain that he was suffering from an acute disease. The Count invited Casanova to remain for treatment saying he would prepare 15 pills which in three days would restore the Italian to perfect health. Casanova writes and then he showed me his magistrum which he called an athoeter athoeter and he was a, it was a white liquid contained in a well stopped file. And I'll tell you, man, if an alchemist is out there giving you white liquids, you might want to double check it before you just start on it. That's just what I'm saying. The white eagle <laughs> and the red lion. He told me that this liquid was the universal spirit of nature. Uh huh. And that it was. Uh, the wax of the stopper was pricked even so slightly the whole of the contents would disappear. And I begged him to make the experiment. He thereupon gave me the file and the, and the pin, and I myself pricked the wax. Whoa, let's look at all this sexy stuff that's going on here. When lo, the file was empty, Casanova, being somewhat of a rogue himself, doubted all other men. Therefore, he refused to permit St. Germain to treat his malady. He could not deny, however, that St. Germain was a chemist of extraordinary skill, whose accomplishments were astonishing, if not practical. The adept refused to disclose the purpose for which the chemical experiments were needed, maintaining that such information could not be communicated. Casanova further records an incident in which St. Germain changed a 12 soul piece into pure gold coin. I told you, you cannot trust these alchemists. <laughs> Here, tr- t- penetrate this. Drink that. Being a doubting Thomas, Casanova declared that he felt sure that St. Germain had substituted one coin for another. He intimated so uh, to the Count who replied, Those who are capable of entertaining doubts of my work are not worthy to speak to me. He bowed the Italian out, and this was the last time Casanova ever saw St. Germain. There is other evidence that the celebrated Count possessed an alchemical powder by which it is possible to transmute base metals into gold. He actually performed this feat on at least two occasions. As attested by the writings of contemporaries, the Marquis de Vable, Valbel, writing St. Germain in his laboratory, found the alchemist busy with his furnaces, and he asked the Maki for twelve silver six-franc piece, and covering it with a black substance exposed it to the heat of a small flame or furnace. The Maki de Valbel saw the coin change colors, and we know what color it turns, right? Black and white are all I see in my infancy red until it turned a bright red and some minutes after it had cooled a little bit, the adept took it out of the cooling vessel and retain- and returned it to the maki. The piece was no longer silver, but black then white are all I see in my infancy red and yellow then came to be. The piece was no longer silver, but of the purest gold. Transmutation had been complete. The 
Countess de Admar had possession of this coin until 1786 when it was stolen from her secretary. One author tells us that St. Germain always attributed his knowledge of occult chemistry to his sojourn in Asia in 1755. He went to the East again for the second time and writing the Count von Lamberg, he says, I am indebted for my knowledge of melting jewels to my second journey to India. There are too many authentic cases of metallic transmutations to condemn St. Germain as a charlatan for such a feat. The Leopold Hoffman medal still in the possession of the family is the most outstanding example of the transmutation of metals ever recorded. Two-thirds of this metal was transformed into gold by the monk Wenzel Seller. Leaving the, ba the balance silver, which was uh, its original state. In this case, fraud was impossible, but there was but one copy of the metal extant. The ease with which we condemn a fraudulent and unreal anything which transcends our understanding was brought unjustified calumny upon the names and memories of many illustrious persons. The popular belief that Count St. Germain was merely an adventurer is not supported by even a shred of evidence. Did you hear me, Encyclopedia of the Occult? Not a shred. He was never detected in any subterfuge, nor did he betray, even to the slightest degree, the comf the confidence entrusted in him, his great wealth, for he was always amply supplied with the world's goods, was not extracted from those with whom he came in contact. He wasn't a grifter, is what he's saying. Every effort to determine the source and the size of his fortune was fruitless. He made use of neither bank nor banker, yet moved in a sphere of unlimited credit, which he neither questioned by others or abused by himself. Referring to the attacks upon his character, H.B. Blavatsky wrote in The Theosophist in March 1881, quote, Do charlatans enjoy the confidence and admiration of the cleverest statesmen and nobles in Europe? For long years, and not even at their deaths, show in one thing that they were undeserving. Some encyclopedists see the new American encyclopedia. Uh, I guess volume 14, I guess that's what this means. 266, he says, he is supposed to have been employed during the greater part of his life as a spy at the courts which he resided. But upon what evidence is this supposition based? Has anyone found in any of the state papers in the secret archives of either of these courts not one word, not one shred of fact to build this base of culminy upon has ever been found? It is simply a miraculous lie. The treatment this great man, this pupil of Indian and Egyptian hierophants is proficient in the secret wisdom of the East, has had Western writers as a stigma upon human nature. Nothing is known concerning the source of the Count St. Germain occult knowledge. Most certainly, he not only imitated, or sorry, intimated his possessions of a vast amount of wisdom, but he also gave many examples to support his claim. He asked once about himself. He replied that his father was the secret doctrine and his mother were the mysteries. St. Germain, who thoroughly conversant with the principles of Oriental esotericism, he practiced the Eastern system of meditation and concentration. Upon several occasions, having been seated with his feet crossed and his hands folded in the posture of the Hindu Buddha, 
He had a retreat in the heart of the Himalayas to which he retired periodically from the world. On one occasion, he, he declared that he would remain in India for 85 years and then return to the scene of his European l labors. At various times, he admitted that he was obeying the orders of a power higher and greater than himself. He did not say what that superior power was. The mystery school, which had sent him into the world to accomplish some def uh, definite mission. The Count St. Germain and Sir Francis Bacon are the two greatest emissaries sent into the world by this secret brotherhood in the last thousand years. So you can go, you guys can go back to um, Manly P. Hall. I did a mayor, I did, boy, I've done, I think, three, well, one American sermon episode. Uh, revolving around the Manly P. Hall, the secret, I, this idea of the secret order of philosophers that move um, behind the scenes through history, uh, manipulating of events and all this stuff. So that's interesting. And then I think I did two episodes way back at the beginning. So they're probably available here in the Red Archive if you're interested. Um, they were called, I believe there are two of them. I think that they were called the secret destiny, the secret destiny of America, maybe. Anyhow, they're interesting. And that's kind of what they're, that's kind of what this last statement is talking about. The secret brotherhood, um, where Francis Bacon and account St. Germain, um, are, are part of this manly P hall would call them like the secret philosophers or something like this. And this is literally where, I mean, the reason that I know about Count St. Germain is, um, I don't want to say I based a character off of him, but I have a character that is like him in my, gra in my comic books and graphic novels. Cyrus, the dead guy can be in some ways, sort of like, a sort of like a parallel to Count St. Germain. He's not like an alchemist or whatever, but you know, he, I don't want to give too much away. He's like, uh, he shows up around the beginning and something happens and he, uh, he, he pops up through throughout history. And in some ways he fills this role of a secret philosopher, especially where it comes to the foundation of, uh, of America. That stuff is all in the, my latest graphic novel, which is, I don't know, you're, two years, maybe three years old at this point. It's called the ages. It's really cool. It's like the procession, the astrological proce procession of the ages is like the framing device. It's like the story stretches like three of these, uh, astrological eight ages. It's interesting. It goes from, when the sun would rise in the east in the time of Gemini all the way to all the way to Aqu Aquarius. So there's like th three or no four of these giant chunks of time. They're like 2,155 years and some change, something like that. If memory serves. Anyhow, off on this screen, let's get back to it. The Trinisophia. But like the Count, Cyrus has also been a bit of a dandy from time, from time to time. So the principles disseminated by the Count St. Germain were undoubtedly Rosicrucians in origin and perm permeated with the doctrine of the Gnostics. The Count was moving the spirit of the Rosicrucianism during the 18th century, possibly the actual head of that order. And in, that you find that everywhere. If you start looking at, the, at Count St. Germain, you're going to find his link with Rosicrucianism or the Rosy Cross is everywhere. They were suspected of being the great power behind the French Revolution. This is that idea of the secret philosophers that push history, push history forward. 
There's also a reason to believe that Lord Bulwar Lytton's famous novel Zanoni was actually concerned with the life and activities of St. Germain. He generally regarded as an important figure in the early activities of the Freemasons. Repeated efforts, however, probably with an ulterior motive, have been made to discredit his Masonic affiliation. Mags of London are offered for, uh, for sale a Masonic minute book in which the signatures of both Count St. Germain and the Marquis de Lafayette appear. Wow, that would be really cool. It will yet be established beyond a doubt that the Count was both a Mason and a Templar. In fact, the memoirs of Cagliostro contain a direct statement of his own initiation into the Order of the Knights Templar at the hands of St. Germain. Many of these illustrious personages with whom the Count associated were High Masons. Sufficient memorabilia have been preserved concerning the the discussions which they held to prove that he was a chaster of Freemasonic lore. So I thought it was interesting because we just finished the Second Crusade, um, the series of Second Crusade episodes. So I thought it would be cool to link the, the Templars into into this. All right, so here, I'm going to just crack this book, The International Encyclopedia of Secret Societies and Fraternal Orders by Alan Axelrod. And we're just going to talk, just kept, we've, I've never done a deep dive into Rosicrucian, Rosicrucianism on the show before. So I feel like I'm kind of just leaving a lot on the table here, if I just move on. So, um... So here we go. This book is pretty cool. The International Encyclopedia of Secret Societies and Fraternal Orders. The Rosicrucians. The Rosicrucians are one of the most mysterious of all of the major secret societies, at least in origin. When the public was first appraised of their existence through the publication of the Fama Fortanis of the Meritorious Order of the Rosy Cross in Germany in 1614. Several leading savants, including, we know this chick, right? She's hot, Renee Descartes. <laughs> Deep cut. Came uh, uh, to the conclusion that there was no such order of the Brotherhood at all. Okay, so I'm just going to skip through here and read some of the interesting parts. In all probability, the first stirrings of Rosicrucianism were part of the same unrest they gave uh, to the re- Renaissance, but instead of searching primarily in Greek and Roman sources, the forebearers of Rosicrucians went back to the Near Eastern sources, the Jewish Kabbalah and the works attributed to Hermes Trismegistus. I'm skipping ahead. In the New Age pursuits of the late 20th century, these two streams of thought, uh, which might be called the classical and the Semitic, probably came together in individuals as early as the 14th century, but it was not until the 15th century that there were enough people familiar with both traditions to start what seems to be the origins of Rosicrucianism. Periclesius was one of these such people. Uh, Skipping ahead, there were many more publications, uh, general interest wanted, almost as sharply as it become. According to Rosicrucian theory, the movement operates in 108-year cycles, alternating actions and inactions. Uh, Skipping ahead, some influence on the form of modern Freemasonry uh, as witnesses to some of the degrees of the society were also connected with the Illuminati. Here we go. We're just going to end this. In the later 19th century, the Rosicrucians experienced a considerable revival, but it was mostly in the form of groups that were unable to agree completely concerning the fundamental teachings of the Brotherhood. Alephus Levi laid the groundwork for some, including his own Kabbalistic order of the Rosy Cross. It goes on to uh, name drop Madame Blavatsky here. Um, the roots of the Theosophical Society, as defined by uh, Helena Petrova Blavatsky, grew in the same soil. So there you go. There's your little crash course in Rosicrucianism. It's interesting. I, it's a good thing I just had that book sitting right behind me in my bookshelf. And it was already highlighted. 
all the stuff that I just read was already in the highlighted part. So I already, I, apparently at some point in time, I uh, assumed that, that was going to, that was going to happen to me. Madame D. Admar, who preserved so many of the antidotes of the uh, life of the Wonder Man, copied from one of St. Germain's letters the following prophetic verse pertaining to the downfall of the French Empire. All right, this is building off the idea that we were just talking about, about how Rosicrucianism was actually the great power behind the French Revolution. The time is fast approaching when imprudent France, surrounded by misfortune she might have spared herself, will call to mind such hell as Dante painted. Falling shall we see scepter, censor, and scales, towers, and eschatons. Even the white flag, great streams of blood are flowing in each town. Sobs only do I hear, and exiles see on all sides civil discord loudly roars, and uttering cries on all sides virtue flees. As from assembly votes of death arise, great God who can reply to murderous judges, and on what brows august I see the swords descend. Marie Antoinette was much disturbed by this direful nature of these prophecies and questioned Madame Ad Adhermar as to her opinion of their significance, and the madam replied, They are dismaying, but certainly they cannot affect your majesty. Madame Adamar also recounts a dramatic incident St. Germain offered to meet the good lady at the Church of the Recollets. The hour of eight o'clock mass and madame went to the appointed place in her sedan chair and recorded the following conversation between herself and the mysterious adept. St. Germain says, I am Cassandra, the prophet of evil, madam. He no sows the wind, reaps the whirlwind. I can do nothing. My hands are tied by a stronger than myself. Madame, will you see the queen? St. Germain, no, she is doomed. Madame, doomed to what? St. Germain, doomed to death. Madame, and you, you too, St. Germain. Yes, like Kazote, the return to the palace, tell the queen to take heed of herself, that this day will be fatal for her. Madame, but Marquis de Lafayette, dot, dot, dot. St. Germain, a balloon inflated with wind, even now there are settling what to do with him, whether he shall be an instrument or a victim, by noon all will be decided. The hour of repose is past, and the decrees of providence must be fulfilled. But the madame asks, what do they want? And Germain, St. Germain answers, the complete ruin of the Bourbons. They will expel them from all the thrones they occupy, and in less than a century they will return in all of their different branches to the rank of the simple private individuals. France is a kingdom, a republic, an empire, and mixed government will be tormented, agitated, torn from the hands of class tyrants. She will pass to those who are ambitious and without merit. Count St. Germain disappeared from the stage of French, French mysticism as suddenly and inexplicably as he appeared. Nothing is known with positive certainty. 
after this disappearance. It is claimed by transcendentalists that he retired to this secret order which had sent him into the world for a particular and a peculiar purpose. Having accomplished this mission, he vanished from the memoirs, Demon Tempts of Charles, Landgrave of Hesse Cassel. We gain several particulars concerning the last years before the death or disappearance of the Hungarian adept. Charles was deeply interested in the occult and the Masonic mysteries and a secret society of which he was the moving spirit held occasional occasional meetings upon his estate. The purpose of this organization were similar to, if not identical with Cagliostro, Cagliostro's Egyptian rite, in fact. After studying the fragments left by Landgrave, Cagliostro's contention that he was initiated into Egyptian masonry by Sount St. Germain is proved beyond. So we do have a few minutes here. Um, and we did talk a lot about this guy, this bro, uh, Cagliostro in this episode. So I thought that since we kind of ended with, uh, circling back around on him, I thought that I would just grab my encyclopedia of occultism, uh, by Lewis Spence and just kind of do like an introduction to Cagliostro. Um, since we do have, I don't know, four, four and a half minutes. One of the greatest occult figures of all time, it was the fashion during the later half. The 18th century to regard Cagliostro as a charlatan or an imposter. And this point of view was greatly aided by the savage attack perpetrated upon his memory by Carlyle, who alluded to him as a prince of quacks. I know the first time I ever heard of this guy, Cagliostro. Do you know what it was? I bet you can guess if you're good enough. If you're old enough, maybe. The, he was a he was a side care. He was a supporting member of um, the cast of Spawn, the first Spawn comic books back in the back in the day. I remember just stumbling all over his name. I feel like I got a pretty good handle on it nowadays. That's all muscle memory. He's talking about it. It's like, why would you name this character Cagliostro? And I'm like, why couldn't you just find a cooler name? But then you, re I realized that it was of an actual dude. Back to the encyclopedia. Recent researchers, however, and especially those made by Mr. W.R.H. Trowbridge and his Cagliostro, The Splendor and Misery of a Master of Magic, published in 1910, to show that if Cagliostro was not a man of impe impeachable honor, he was by no means the quack, the scoundrel that so many people have made him out to be. In the Spawn comic books, I don't think he's in the movie. I don't know how big of a deal he is. After the first couple Spawn comic books, I let it go. Like, I was over it. Because um, I'm like, I can never get over how silly the cape is. <laughs> like, why would you want this big cape blocking your side your peripheral vision. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. You don't have the necromantic power to understand how Spawn perceives the three-dimensional universe. Um, but in... <laughs> God, my fucking geek flag just fell out of my pocket. So the deal was in Spawn is he was kind of like a Gandalf character. Like, he just kind of, like, showed up. And he was like a gr dirty kind of... Maybe he was in the fucking movie. I don't know. That movie was so bad. I don't... All right, I got to wrap it up. Let's see. In the first place, it will be well to give a brief outline to this life as known to us before Mr. Trowbridge's examination of the whole question placed Cagliostro's circumstances in a different light and then to check the details of his career and the view of what might... Okay, I'm not going to have time to do any of this. I'm going to bookmark it. I'll make a note. And maybe we'll come back to old Cagliostro. 
I'm John Towers. This has been the Ambercast. Thank you guys for all of your support. This fellow craft episode uh, on Count St. Germain Part 2. Thank you for listening to this episode. Send an email or visit us on social media to let us know what you think about this topic. And please remember to leave a five-star rate and review. Thank you for listening, and we hope that you enjoyed the show. Please send an email or find us on social media and let us know what you think about the show. We would appreciate it if you would give us a five-star rate and review wherever you find your favorite podcasts. You can find Stigmata Studios, graphic, novels, and comic books at apricast.com.